Thank you for joining us today. My name is Keith Larson, and I'm the president of the Louisville Forum. The Louisville Forum meets on the second Wednesday of every month at Vincenzo's Restaurant. The Louisville Forum is a nonpartisan public issues group founded in 1984. The forum hosts debates and discussions of contemporary and sometimes contentious public policy issues that affect the greater Louisville community. Although we may take up issues that have a national interest, we try to highlight the local perspective. For more information on the Louisville Forum and becoming a member, please visit our website, louisvilleforum.org. Today's topic is, should our schools teach critical race theory? As we all know, the potential banning of critical race theory in Kentucky's public schools and universities has become one of the most divisive issues in Frankfurt and at school board meetings across the state. Joining us today to unpack this issue, on my right is Professor Cedric Powell, a University of Louisville School of Law professor who teaches critical race theory. And to my left, State Representative Jennifer Decker from <coughs> District 58, who has pre-filed a bill that some say will ban the teaching of critical race theory in Kentucky. Moderating our discussion today is Mary Irby Jones, executive editor of the Courier Journal. We've asked both speakers to give brief opening remarks and then Ms. Irby Jones will lead us in a discussion. So kicking us off today, we have Professor Powell. Professor Powell is the Wyatt, Tarrant and Combs Professor of Law at the University of Louisville Brandeis School of Law. Professor Powell has written and taught about critical race theory and affirmative action. His scholarship critiques neutrality as a means of preserving structural inequality. Publication of his book, Post-Racial Constitutionalism and the Roberts Court by Cambridge University Press is forthcoming. Please join me in welcoming Professor Powell. Thank you so much, Keith. I appreciate the opportunity to speak here. And I want to thank the Louisville Forum Board members, Kaylin Walls, a former student and soon to be distinguished member of the bar, guests and friends of the Louisville Forum, Brandeis School of Law alumni, my newest colleague, Cassie Armstrong, council member, and Emily Pinarola, a great friend and former student and now distinguished member of the bar. I am honored to be given the privilege of offering my views on this important topic. I checked and it's been 18 years since the last time I spoke here, and I hope it wasn't something I said then. <laughs> <laughs> we have uh, five to seven minutes, and I'm going to do three things in my five to seven minutes. One, I want to talk about context. Two, I want to talk about what critical race theory is and what it is not. And then three, I want to talk about moving forward. What does the First Amendment mean? And the title of my remarks today are, is Race Rhetoric and the New Politics of Misdirection. I want to re briefly explore this topic, race rhetoric and the new politics of misdirection, by opening up with a quotation from Timothy Snyder, the Levin Professor of History at Yale, in his powerful little book on tyranny, 20 Lessons from the 20th Century, he offers a great starting point for my remarks. Avoid pronouncing the phrases everyone else does. Think up your own way of speaking, even if only to convey that thing you think everyone else is saying. Make an effort to separate yourself from the internet. Read books. So it is important for us to think for ourselves and the state cannot do that for us. We must do that for ourselves. On some level in our community and in this nation, we have lost the capacity to do so because we rely on easy reasoning, gross generalizations, non-critical absolutes, and formalisms that provide a comfortable substitute for rigorous engagement with complex issues. 
So I want to talk about the importance of understanding context. Why are we here? What critical race theory is? And then what is our responsibility to our children, to our democracy? And how do we move forward? The importance of context. We are in the midst of the third reconstruction, a period of racial turmoil, existential political strife, and retrogression deceptively packaged as a fight for America's patriotic values, making our country great again, voter suppression disguised as making our democracy open and fraud free, prompted by a disputed presidential election. We're in the midst of a racial reckoning, Black Lives Matter movement, the death of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and a pandemic that is still ravaging our nation and dividing us by exposing structural inequality on all levels of society. Think of the rhetoric that circulates in the public sphere. Charlottesville, good people on both sides. Insurrection, patriots and tourists who are not violent, by the way, but what about Black Lives Matter and Antifa? Progress by people of color viewed skeptically, voter fraud, the big lie, and legislative enactments in 48 states pursuing illusory fraud. Fear of a changing country and demographics. While demographics is not destiny, we understand why these debates are circulating. White supremacy is on the rise. And there's the 1619 Project, which makes essential connections between slavery and 21st century America. The fourth full-scale study of the continuing effects of past discrimination. The response to this by the former president was to publish the 1776 Commission, which was a response to the 1619 Project designed to restore the luster and glory to American history. Love for country above all else was the guiding principle. The former president also issued a proclamation to educational institutions to stop teaching critical race theory, which, is fostered, which fosters hatred for America, he says, hate for, for white people, and divisiveness by constant emphasis on race. That brings us to critical race theory, my point number two. Critical race theory is not Marxist. Critical legal studies examined that, but that was by a group of white scholars who did not conceptualize race in any way. And that's why you have critical race theory coming into existence in 1989 at a conference at the University of Wisconsin. So critical race theory is not racist. It does not teach hatred of white people or of America. It focuses on structural inequality, systemic racism, and how law perpetuates the subordination of oppressed peoples. And it has four or five central tenets. Many people argue about this, but they are racism is ordinary and difficult to address because it is never a knowledge. Interest convergence, there's very little incentive to eradicate racism unless it aligns with the interests of whites. Hello? Uh, <laughs> and race is socially constructed. Society invents race to advance the interests of white supremacy. Intersectionality is another that no person has a single, easily situated unitary identification and that the unique voice of oppressed people should be heard. Now this does not mean inventing history to suit one's own political interests. And that brings me to my third point, moving forward. The First Amendment prohibits the state from compelling people to think in a certain way. Freedom of speech means something in our polity. Students do not lose their constitutional rights at the schoolhouse door. Freedom of thought is the guiding principle of our democracy and of this forum. Legislators do not craft the curriculum and neither do parents. There is no indoctrination of students in our schools. Critical race theory is not taught in elementary or secondary schools. We want our students to be well-rounded, educated, empowered, able to understand the complex history of the United States. History is not linear post-racial narratives of uninterrupted success and prosperity. And pointing this out does not mean that you hate America. 
We want a well-educated citizenry of critical thinkers who make their own independent judgments without being told what to think by the state. It is how we teach that matters. Our children deserve a full, complete, and unedited history of the United States. American exceptionalism cannot be the guiding principle of our history. We cannot use constructive narratives to rationalize our mistakes. What is striking about the proposed legislation is that it attempts to codify the subjective sentiments of the state by protecting individuals. There are contrived concerns about hurting children's feelings and children of color self-stigmatizing themselves. We should not legislate stereotypes or enact polemics. Finally, there was an editorial in the Sunday New York Times, July 18, 2021, by Melinda Winner Moyer. Really, talk to your kids about racism, why a complete critical history is important. And I'll end with this. If race is largely a social construct, then teaching children about racism will only perpetuate racism, right? Wrong. Studies show precisely the opposite. Open conversations about race and racism can make white children less prejudiced and can increase the self-esteem of children of color. If states ban the teaching of critical race theory as conservative lawmakers and many are attempting to do, or if schools don't provide consistent education about racism and discrimination, it's imperative that parents pick up the slack. So-called colorblind parenting, avoiding the topic of race in an effort to raise children who aren't prejudiced is not just unhelpful, it actually perpetuates racism. That's because racism isn't driven solely by individual prejudice. It is a system of inequity bolstered by racist laws and policies. The very fact that opponents, that, that opponents of teaching critical race theory are trying to erase. Thank you. Thank you, <clears throat> Thank you Professor Powell. Uh, our next speaker, Representative Jennifer Decker, represents the District 58 in the Kentucky General Assembly. She is also the Executive Director of Operation CARE, a Christian nonprofit that provides services through a transitional housing program for homeless women and children. Representative Decker is a graduate of the University of Kentucky College of Law, where she graduated with honors, Order of the Coif. She also holds both an undergraduate and a graduate degree from Eastern Kentucky University, graduating with the highest distinctions in each degree. Representative Decker is the former chair of the Shelby County Republican Party. Please join me in welcoming Representative Decker. nice to be invited today. Thank you all so much. I have been here several times to hear programs and have been a guest. I have never spoken, Professor, so you've been, you've been a speaker more than I, but it is an honor to be invited here today um, and to be discussing this issue with you, Professor. Thank you. Appreciated your comments. I was asked to speak today because I, have, I am the primary co-sponsor of BR 69, which is a bill that seeks to prohibit the state sponsored promotion in public education of the entire social justice concepts of CRT and its progeny. According, um, according to the critical race theory, CR, some of the theorists who have written about it, it began as an academic movement interested in studying and transforming the relationship among race, racism, and, and power. Many Americans, though, have fallen for the false notion that CRT is simply a full consideration of history, including objective facts that have until now been avoided because they're uncomfortable. That is not what the study is. Four leading critical race theorists dispel this naive notion themselves when they wrote in words that wound that critical race theorists embrace subjectivity of perspective and are avowedly political. Those are their words about their work. 
In addition, in words that wound, critical race theorists state, we use personal history, history, parables, chronicles, dreams, stories, poetry, fiction, and revisionist histories to convey our message. These are their words about their work. Our public schools should not promote subjective political ideology or revisionist histories. I agree that full history, the good, the bad, and the ugly should be taught, but not along with the unconstitutional promotion of a biased, harassing interpretation of that history using illiberal social justice concepts stemming from the CRT praxis. Quite simply, BR 69 seeks to prohibit critical pedagogy because it violates the 14th Amendment as well as the Civil Rights Act of 1964. CRT and its social justice progeny theories are hostile to the most foundational American principles of human equality that are woven into our legal and social fabric via the 14th Amendment and the Civil Rights Act of 1964. For example, while our Constitution prohibits discrimination, social justice ideology promotes discrimination. In his book, How to Be an Anti-Racist, Ibram Kendi states the only remedy to racist discrimination is anti-racist discrimination. The only remedy to past discrimination is present discrimination. The only remedy to present discrimination is future discrimination. That is his words. According to CRT, race is a social construct, as the professor mentioned. It's not biologically natural. Racism in America is a norm and not aberrational, and every legal advancement that has been made in our country for people of color has been to serve one or more interest groups who are white. That is the overlay on our history. CRT and other social justice concepts fail to recognize the progress we've made throughout history. It does not recognize that any atonement for slavery has already been t taken, even though more people died in the fight to end slavery than in any war in our nation's history. Despite the struggle that took place to enact the Civil Rights Act, despite the advancements our nation has made in providing equal protection under the law, is there need for vast improvement still? Yes, absolutely. To make further advancements, however, we do not need the racial division and hostility CRT offers. Instead, we need to focus on solving the real causes of the disparate outcomes we find in various aspects of our legal, educational, and social systems. There is still work to be done to provide equal protection under the law for everyone. In fact, the current social justice movement rejects the notion that equal protection under the law is attainable in the United States because it holds that our legal system was constructed as a racist tool to protect white supremacy. Derek Bell, the recognized founder of CRT, famously wrote in his essay entitled Racial Realism that racial equity is in fact not a realistic goal. He said that casting off the burdens of equality theory, the foundation of our country, by casting that off, it will lift the sights of, and help to get a bird's eye view of the situation. He said, I am convinced that there is something real out there in America for black people, but it is not the romantic love of integration. It is surely not the long sought after goal of equality under the law. CRT praxis teaches that racism is at the core of every system in America and that white supremacy provided the building blocks for every system. Under current social justice dogma, America must be reimagined, dismantled, and rebuilt on social justice principles of racial equity. In recent years, the failure of CRT as a valid academic framework has been exacerbate, exacerbated by the introduction of the related ideology of anti-racism and um, as a means of bringing about social justice. Ever since author Robin DiAngelo published her book, White Fragility, in 2018, all white critics of CRT have been dismissed or silenced 
by the accusation that they suffer from white fragility. By adding this doctrine of white fragility to the canon of CRT, the tenets of this theory become dangerous propaganda that cannot be discussed. Fear of being ridiculed for objecting to CRT has acted as the final nail that closed the coffin of free and open debate about CRT. Throughout history, ideologues have sought, throughout history, to weaponize the inherent conflicts among people and groups in their geographical borders to bring about revolution. Since beginning their work decades ago, critical race theorists and anti-racist warriors have advocated for the dismantling of the American legal, educational, cultural, <laughs> religious, and economic systems to eradicate perceived white supremacy. By the time the issues surrounding CRT are resolved, I predict that the United States Supreme Court will, will find that the teaching of the basic tenets of this theory in school as true is unconstitutional because it harasses the race it labels as perpetual oppressors and it demeans the race it labels as perpetually oppressed. Such teaching violates the Equal Protection Act Clause of the 14th Amendment and the Civil Rights Act of 1964 by creating a very hostile learning environment. CRT is harassing because it is designed to be that way and make no mistake, in radical realism, Derrick Bell ends by recounting a fictional woman named Mrs. Brianna McDonald, who was a civil rights activist. Bell wrote this fictional narrative to illustrate the point that the struggle for freedom is at bottom a manifestation of our humanity, which survives and grows stronger through resistance to oppression, even if that oppression is not overcome. At the end of this narrative, he quotes Mrs. McDonald as saying, Derek, I am an old woman. I lives to harass white people. Well, time will tell whether a suit will succeed as unconstitutional or whether BR 69 will become law. In the meantime, I intend to work with the overwhelming number of Kentuckians of all races and political parties who want members of the General Assembly to protect students from harassing unconstitutional instruction that promotes the adoption of a worldview based on the preeminent importance of skin color and the view of America as systemically racist. This debate is all about our children, their future, and the future of our state and nation. I believe that with my whole heart. Our public schools have a responsibility to cultivate well-educated citizens and not social justice warriors. Our students deserve education, not indoctrination. Thank you. Okay, I've got a stack of questions here. <laughs> so I, I think some people have some thoughts. Uh, at this point, I'm going to um, introduce our moderator, uh, Mary Irby Jones. Mary was named editor of the Courier Journal in March this year. She has the first woman to lead the 150 year old newspaper. Prior to joining the Courier Journal, Mary was the editor of the Clarion Ledger in Hattiesburg. Before becoming editor of the newspapers in Mississippi, Mary worked as the digital director for the Clarion Ledger, where she oversaw a regional digital operation for eight newsrooms. Mary is a 1988 graduate of the University of Mississippi and member of the Zeta Phi Beta sorority. Thank you, Mary, for joining us today. The floor is all yours, and I'm going to leave some questions here for you. So. Good afternoon, and thank you guys for making my job easy. I have some questions here, and Olivia is here somewhere. She helped me prep for this, but we might not need your questions. Uh, um, I am going to just start off by um, asking uh, both of our panelists um, to talk a little bit more about critical race theory. Um, and I will start with uh, Representative Decker. Um, you said uh, previously that teaching uh, components of critical race theory censors real productive conversations on race, gender, and equality. 
How do you propose that we talk about these issues in our schools? Uh, I didn't understand what quote you just said I said. What was that? I'm sorry. You previously said that teaching the components of critical race theory effectively censors real productive oh. conversations on race, gender, and equality. Right. Well, I don't remember saying that, but I, I believe it's true. Can you all hear, is this on? I don't think it's on. How do, how do we turn it on? It's actually on. Okay. They say they can't hear. Okay. So the thing, what I did, I don't remember saying that, but I do believe it's true that what happens, and we have seen examples of exercises and classroom uh, presentations of social justice training, and there is no discussion. It, it is, uh, it is a, a presentation as if the concepts that are set out in critical race theory and its progeny are true. So it's, it doesn't, it, critical race theory is a theory about history. It is not the facts of history. So inst it, it just teaches people how to think instead of, of allowing them to think. It is, a, it is a presentation of the ills of our country. And again, if it is objected to, it, in fact, I've seen, uh, and just today on my way here, a teacher in the Jefferson County Public School System sent me a plethora of training materials where the teachers are told such things as to, uh, to put aside their whiteness, to listen to and to teach this as if it is true, and that to help the students understand if they object that it is a bias, a cultural bias. So I'm saying it is not the exchange of ideas. It is the teaching of a doctrine without any examination. It has no, um, no relationship to how we normally in a liberal society put forth a theory and then question the theory to falsify it to find truth. This theory is not approached that way. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Professor Powell, you previously stated at a JCPS uh, school uh, meeting that there are a lot of um, ignorant, that there is a lot of ignorance about what crit critical race theory is. You've talked briefly about critical race theory, but what do you teach in your classroom? Well, I have some of my students here, they could tell you. <laughs> I don't know, so. but, but let me, I'm, I wasn't being flipped. Let me just sort of point out that what is frustrating and limiting about this discussion that we're having, and, and, and I'm free to engage the ideas, uh, is that we're not really engaging ideas. Every participation and, and panel and discussion that I've had, and, and there's been 10, 11, maybe even 20 of them, they always start out this way with these uh, selective quotes, and then, aha, Derrick Bell is evil, and Richard Delgado says hate all white people, and there's this training manual that goes out to different people on how to hate white, white people. That is not true. You can take any of my scholarship. And, and that's another problem. People aren't reading, they're just hearing. And so the reason I started off with avoid pronouncing phrases that everyone else does is that exactly what we're doing. We had a former president saying critical race theory is evil. They're coming out to the suburbs, so I'm gonna try and change the federal housing law so those people won't get out here. And that is the context that we're in. So, let me point out a number of things. Critical race theory is certainly a theory, but it critiques structural inequality and systemic policies that advance racism. And so my book, I'm not pubbing my book, but I'll, I'll just show you to illustrate. My book starts in 1883 with the civil rights cases. And everybody talks about Plessy versus Ferguson, but the civil rights cases are devastating. 18 years after the passage uh, 18 years, I'm sorry, after the Civil War, we had our first reconstruction where we had a series of civil rights laws that demolished structural inequality, slavery. Um, and in this case, 1883, we were trying to get public accommodations. There were uh, consolidated cases. African Americans were trying, after 18 years of being free, trying to go to the opera house or a restaurant or somewhere. And this was the first Civil Rights Act. The U.S. Supreme Court says 
there comes a time in the life of every citizen when he has to stop to be uh, the special favorites of the law. You know, that's an affirmative action reverse discrimination argument in 1883. So 18 years after the Civil War, we're saying stop complaining, just move on. And that's the, the topic of this uh, discussion that we're having too. Over and over again, when people of color or poor people or anyone stands up, the people in power say, you're di being divisive, you're focusing on race, you're dividing us, let's move on, race, race, race. Well, I certainly align with the people who are trying to dismantle structural inequality. That doesn't mean that I hate America or want to overthrow the government. I wasn't in DC on January 6th. I wasn't doing that. I'm trying to reason in these public forums, trying to talk about the continuing effects of past discrimination. So that's a long-winded way of saying this. Critical race theory tries to analyze structures and systems. My own scholarship talks about the Equal Protection Clause, and Representative Decker made some points about the 14th Amendment, but they're really rooted in this notion of liberal individualism. In other words, the Constitution protects individuals and not groups, and we don't want to look at group dynamics in terms of how America oppresses. So, Critical race theory tries to take a, a, a structural and critical view of that, doesn't invent facts, but points out facts that do exist, and that upsets some people. Thank you. Representative Decker, next question for you. And this one is from the audience. If the goal is to protect students from the indoctrination of students through CT, CRT, why is it not once mentioned in the proposed bill. Let me repeat that, because I think I missed it. If the goal is to protect students from the indoctrination of students through CRT, why is it not once mentioned in the proposed bill? Well, the proposed bill will be amended before it is introduced, and it may well mention CRT, but the problem with just limiting the discussion to CRT is that that is not all that's being taught in this manner. Social justice theories are what are being taught. So the, it has spawned the, the praxis, the implementation, the, the uh, carrying out of the theory has, has produced a, 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 another complete set in various uh, different iterations of race-based theory. All of it needs to be uh, stop from being indoctrinated. By the way, I keep hearing that we are banning ideas from the classroom. That is not true. Any of this can be discussed and debated and thought about. What this bill does is it may not be promoted by the classroom. And that is what we are finding in the assignments and in the, the, uh, the lectures is that it is being promoted in the classroom as truth. That's what the, the, the uh, training for the teachers is teaching is, is to be a social justice warrior. In fact, if you today go on the Kentucky, University of Kentucky Education College uh, Division of Curriculum and Teaching, you will find that the mission statement now of the, of the college that trains teachers is not to teach curriculum competency or teaching strategies, the, the mission statement is to advance social justice. That is not what our schools are supposed to be about. We, if you are teaching curriculum and teaching, you should be teaching those core principles, not social justice. So our bill is seeking to stop the indoctrination, the promotion, and I, honestly, I don't know how you read the bill without seeing that it specifically states that these concepts are not to be promoted. Thank you, Representative Decker. Another question from the audience for Professor Powell. Do you think that there may be an overcorrection of employment education opportunities as a result of, criti of critical race theory? No, I don't think there's an overcorrection. I think that question sort of looks at, well, we're, 
We're distributing benefits and burdens based upon race. I don't think there's been an overcorrection. Uh, if you look at any system, employment discrimination, voting rights, uh, what we have is retrogression. We always make progress, and that's good. I think we all acknowledge that. But there's always a point where we go backwards, so I don't think there's ever been a, 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 an overcorrection. There have been corrections that have been uh, diluted by the way systems and processes work. Now, just get in one thing from the aside. Someone asked why was critical race theory not explicitly mentioned in this statute? I think everyone knows that this statute is unconstitutional. When we litigate this or wherever we litigate it, it's hopelessly overbroad, as vague, as ambiguous. It's an example of censorship. Uh, enforcement is going to be a problem. And the reason you don't mention critical race theory is because the state cannot be involved in content regulation. That's con law 101. And whenever the state is involved in content or subject matter regulation, you apply strict scrutiny and it's going to be held unconstitutional. So this statute or legislative enactment is on the precipice of constitutional oblivion. I don't think it's going anywhere. Thank you. Republican Decker. <laughs> I mean, uh, yeah, representative. Right. I understand. <laughs> <laughs> Are you <done> there? <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> Your bill, but true. Democrat oh, it's true. Yeah, sure. <laughs> Not a slur. <laughs> Not intended. Your bill makes it illegal, and this one is also from the audience. Your bill makes it illegal for classroom discussion to cause an individual to feel discomfort, guilt, anguish, or any other form of psychological distress on account of his or her race, sex, or religion. My grandfather was a soldier in the German, German army during World War II. How do you expect the Holocaust to be taught without causing my child discomfort or anguish? I, I just don't believe the person who wrote that question could have read the bill because it does not say that classroom instruction cannot cause those feelings. What it says is that those feelings could not be promoted as proper feelings. It cannot be that when you study uh, the Holocaust that you are told your race has caused that and you should feel guilt. You should then want to repair the damage because you are systemically racist. You can't help it, you're white. And so if you feel oppressed, it's because you should. I took black history in college. I can tell you when I read Invisible Man, I felt anguish. I felt horrible empathy. We want that for our children. We want them to find that for themselves. We do not want them to be told that they are responsible for that, that living in the 21st century, when we read Uncle Tom's Cabin, they are to take ownership of that. So the bill does not say that people are to be shielded from those emotions. Our children should learn empathy. But they should, that is a human condition. They should, when they read the, the actual literature and history of slavery, they will feel that. But they are to be left to feel that. They are, they are allowed to talk about it. They have free speech rights in schools. The children have, can speak about political matters, the same as anything else. What our bill prohibits is instruction requiring and and instructing and promoting guilt, anguish, et cetera. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. There are a lot more questions for you than for, for, for oh, Professor Pat. So I'm trying to balance this. <laughs> but I'm going to go to you with another question okay. just because there are so many. Yeah, right. It seems that most people promoting CRT believe that we don't teach enough about Racism and black history. How can we address this concern and shed light on racial issues without CRT? What is the alternative? I'm all for including more black history, not just in February. I would have loved to have learned in school about the mathematicians who helped the space program work. I don't know, I, I, I would be all for uh, revising textbooks to include more illustrations of black history, both good and bad. I did not know about the Tulsa riots. 
I think that's a, a fair topic. Uh, so I th the history is not the problem. The history should be taught, it should be studied, it should be debated, it should be thought about. What this bill aims at is the social theory being advanced by the state as truth, and that's what we see happening. I, I do want to make a comment, though. I've, I've heard several times about selective quotes and reading things off the internet. I have read a stack of books by the critical race theorists. When I quote from them, it's because I read the books and found them. I also read Professor, uh, Professor Powell's, several of his law re review articles. I read the one he mentioned about the Fourth Amendment, uh, 14th Amendment, and, it was, and I was interested in it because it illustrates what critical race theory does. He believes that we have a bedrock belief in America in individuality and freedom. Of, of protecting an individual from discrimination, from punishing the discriminator who is discriminating. But the, the work he's talking about, and I think he's written it in several places, is that the 14th Amendment is in, incorrectly uh, applied by, by the Supreme Court in America. And we need to deconstruct all that because it, it applies the principles that I mentioned. And as he just stated, he said that the liberal interpretation of the 14th Amendment that I just talked about, being individual, is wrong. And, and he talks about how it came in, it was enacted after slavery, and that it was actually meant uh, to keep from <coughs> subjugating groups, and that that's the interpretation that should be given, and that would be the interpretation needing, needed for current reparations and current deconstruction of individual rights. So, I have read the, the writings, Professor, and I find them to be instructive. Thank you. Would you like to respond? Well, I think you just illustrated my point. Uh, so you, you went through the discussion about the 14th Amendment. That's true. But my conclusions are, are correct because they're rooted in the legislative history of the Reconstruction Amendments. And you, you should have mentioned that if you're going to critique uh, how I view liberal individualism, and you didn't do that. And so that's what I mean in terms of selectivity. You quoted words that wound uh, by Charles Lawrence and Mary Matsuda and did not mention uh, the central analytical framework of that work. It's talking about the First Amendment, not uh, individual subjective feelings. And it's talking about how the First Amendment impacts people of color and how there should be an action for that based upon discrimination by the states. So. The, the reason I'm pushing back is I think that if, you, if you're going to critique critical race theory, you have to view it as an academic discipline that seeks to fill in the gaps of history, analysis, and a broad range of law, from employment law, housing discrimination, voting rights. I mean, we really should be talking about voting rights uh, because there have been a whole series of uh, decisions by the Supreme Court where theories and doctrines are invented and then the court uh, guts the Voting Rights Amendment of, of, of 1965. May I make one comment sure. in response? So uh, I think you just stated something that bothers uh, the people who promote this bill, is that you said that you want to fill in the gaps of history with the theory. Well, a theory is a theory, and it does not fill in gaps of history other than as a theory that should be debated and, and falsified if possible. So I think that is the purpose of CRT and its progeny, is to fill in gaps of a theory, as if it's history. Thank you. Avoid pronouncing the phrases everyone else does. That's all I have to say on that. So critical race theory, you teach it in college. Law school. Law school. Should it be taught in K-12? Of course not. I mean, it's not even being taught in K-12. I think what you're getting in K-12 is a full, comprehensive analysis of United States history. And that's what I meant in filling the gaps. And filling in the gaps is not theory. I mean, critical race theory would look at, you take the 1619 Project. It looks at the present day effects of past discrimination, how structural inequality works. And then the pushback is, well, you're talking about slavery that happened 150 years ago. I wasn't here. I didn't do anything about that. You're saying I hate white people. 
Critical race theory doesn't do that. It looks at the structural components of slavery and then looks at how that is projected in the present. So there's a reason why there's a West End. You know, that didn't happen by accident. It's not housing choice and neutral and the housing market was open and I decided to live here and then the Ninth Street. And we overlooked these things. There was a systemic practice of redlining financed by the federal government. The documents are there. And so what do you call that? Am I hating America when I point that out? I want to live wherever I want to, but I don't want to be stigmatized by the government itself. Uh, and so I think you have read the readings, but your slant is different than, than what I'm projecting in my readings and other critical race scholars. I looked at the bill, and, and this is another thing I want to encourage everyone to do. Look at the bill and read it. I mean, I, and I, I think I had a right bill, and, and it, you make the point about not promoting or following these uh, concepts, but what is really breathtaking about this bill is that it always talks about the individual. There are at least 12 references to the individual. So on some level, you're attempting to codify stereotypes in order to undermine teaching of any comprehensive history of America. And that doesn't mean you hate America, but America isn't this long uh, John Wayne movie of, oh, we found the West and these people weren't really here, but we'll take it anyway or the Alamo that just happened and you know, bring in Davy Crockett, wrong historical period, but it doesn't matter because it's always America is right and heroic. And that's fine, I'm here to stay. There's nowhere else I can go. So what I'm trying to do is make America better by rejecting all of these stereotypes uh, and fictitious notions of history. You know, you watch a cowboy movie and it's like uh, the savages are just around and we need to get rid of these people because they don't know what to do with the land. You know, if you look at, and I teach race and the law, I teach a whole series of treaties that the United States made with Native American and indigenous people. Why do you think they did that? They want to promote that America is great and we tried to negotiate with these people, but they just didn't get it. And when they didn't get it, we had to do something else. We try to move them off. Oh, they didn't like that. They're going to fight back. And so we have the might. We exterminate them. And then we say, oh, it was, a, it was a war that we had to have. So how do you take a land where people are already here, claim it for your own, and then say that's right? And if you point that out, you hate America. That should be taught in the schools. And you can call that whatever you want to, but it needs to be taught. Thank you. See if I can get this right. I was actually almost promoting you, and so I was trying to get it right and say the I wrong appreciate word. that. I was about to call you senator, but not yet right. <laughs> <laughs> Here's you. a question from mm -hmm. the audience. If a so-called CRT bill were passed, were to pass, it would almost certainly be challenged in the courts. As an elected official and steward of public funds, how much are you willing to spend in public dollars to defend a concept that your bill does not even define? Um, I, I, I guess the thought is that it would be overbroad or uh, unconstitutional under free speech rights. Teachers and staff at K through 12 schools, uh, that law is settled. That is a compelled speech. It is compulsory education. That those, uh, the, the, the teachers do not have free speech rights. They follow a curriculum set by the state. So it is proper for the state to set the curriculum. The state has uh, pays for the education. And in fact, our statutes say that, the, that, that values education are to reflect, and this is in statute, to reflect the values of the community. So the legislature has a great role to play in legislating what happens in K through 12 schools. And that whole argument is, is just uneducated about the, the rule of law in, in the laws of our state. Uh, a school employee who goes away from the curriculum has violated her, and, and can be uh, reprimanded for that. That is all red letter law. In college, there is academic freedom. It's not absolute. Uh, for example, in colleges, you cannot teach harassing 
uh, you cannot have harassment in your classes. And I believe by the end that that's what this is all going to be found to be, is harassment. Uh, also, you cannot teach classes that violate the Civil Rights Act for that reason or violate equal protection under the law. I believe this theory, even the teaching of it, does that. But there is the doctrine of academic freedom for college professors to write, to research, to instruct, and this bill will be accurate when it is finally filed. There will not be any violations of, of law. Uh, and I agree that legislators should pay attention to the constitutionality of bills. I think that's a good point. I agree with it. We're running out of time. So this question is for both of you and okay. it's from the audience. Kentucky is already way behind other states in educational achievement standards. Kentucky, shouldn't Kentucky first teach math, science, English, and computer science better? Absolutely. The focus on social equity is misplaced. It does not, it will not prove to, to help. You know, I, I was looking at the, thinking about the movie where the, the, the um, African American mathematicians helped NASA. And, and I wrote their, down their names, Mary Jackson, Katherine Johnson, Dorothy Vaughn. They would not have achieved what they did. We would not have been in space the way we were if their schools had focused not on curriculum and instruction, but on social justice. What our students need to, to have is instruction in math, science, etc. This focus is ill-placed, and it will not serve the, it, Teaching a child that they are in a subordinate group that has always been uh, enslaved and, and pushed down is not going to help them get a job in any field that is going to advance them or their society. So it is a misplaced doctrine, it is a misplaced focus, and it needs to be stopped and corrected. Your answer? I haven't met any children of color, uh, including my own, who, who self-stigmatize because they're in the classroom. Uh, I, I've never understood that argument. I mean, it's an argument that Clarence Thomas makes, but uh, even he embraced his own blackness when he needed to get onto the Supreme Court. So, you know, we could go around and around in circles on this. I think the question is interesting about what needs to be taught. Uh, on some level, the question is, is instrumentalist because it just says, uh, teach the students what they need to know, reading, writing, and arithmetic, and that's fine. But the students need to have their own identity. They need to understand where they are in the world. And I think uh, we're not being really realistic if we look at the school as just teaching those, those subjects. Uh, if you take chemistry, you wouldn't uh, have a bill that says we're not going to teach about molecules and moles because the students will be stigmatized or they might feel uncomfortable talking about molecules and moles. That is the content of, of chemistry. It's the same thing with American history. You can't have a history book uh, that says, yeah, there was slavery, things got better, Martin Luther King gave this nice speech and everyone's equal, and then quote over and over again the content of the character. Uh, that drives me absolutely crazy when that happens because no one focuses on the speech that Martin Luther King gave a year before his death at Riverside Church. No one focuses on that. They focus on I have a dream. But that was a radical speech. That was a speech talking about dismantling structural inequality. So I think you can have both, a long-winded way of saying both. You have to teach math and science. You also have to teach history. And you also have to model and teach students to be public citizens, actively engaged, whatever uh, political views they have, they should have the tools to understand and engage in society. And that's what we should be doing. Thank you both. I'll turn it back over to Keith. Well, on behalf of the Louisville Forum, thank you so much to our speakers and our moderator today. This was a great discussion. Uh, thank you all for coming out. Uh, it's great to see all your faces again, not through a, a laptop, but in person. And our next program, we are going to get back to meeting on the second Wednesday um, of every month here at Vincenzo's. Our next program is going to be Wednesday, August 11th at noon. And we are going to review your note cards uh, here in a little bit and come up with a topic, and we'll let you know as soon as we do. Thanks so much for coming. <laughs>